to today's episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. I'm joined today by Fred Valles, who uh, has been a friend of mine for, for, for quite a while. Um, he's the CEO yep. of Optimizer. Previously, he was an evangelist at Google, and we're going to talk about both what? of those uh, scenarios today. Uh, but I, I, I'm delighted to have you on the show, Fred. Thanks for, for agreeing to kind of mm-hmm. come on and talk to me. Yeah, I mean, how could I say no to you, Jim? Um, such a great friend for such a long time. So thanks for having me on your new show. Um, so, so let's go. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you kind of get into to being a digital marketer in the first place? How did you kind of get your job at Google? Well, the, the real backstory is that in 1998, I was at Stanford University and I wanted to make a little bit of money. And I, uh, I figured out that Blockbuster, the video cassette chain, was selling these uh, big popular movies. They, they would sell these cassettes rather cheap compared to what they would cost on the primary market. Um, but I needed people to know that I had these cassettes. So I found goto.com and I could buy PPC clicks. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, right, here's a hit movie. Like, let me buy some keywords for the actors' names and then let me lead that to a listing on eBay and sell these cassettes. So that was really my first foray into PPC. Now, Buying a few cassettes at your local blockbuster, you can imagine, like, I wasn't raking in the dough, right? I was selling a couple of cassettes here and there. And then, um, you know, I joined a consulting company in 2000 after I graduated from Stanford. It's it's sapient, but uh, the dot-com bubble is at its peak. It's starting to implode, and fairly shortly after joining sapient, I'm on the bench, and then I get laid off. And so now it's 2002. And I'm looking for a job, and and there's this like weird little search engine that is, seems to be gaining momentum. It's called Google, and I'm like, I don't really get it because I I'm used to going to Excite and Yahoo and like these portals and like the homepage is full of stuff that you can interact with. And then there's this search box on Google, um, but slowly I start catching on to the fact that the search is actually quite good. Um, and maybe that's why people are talking about it. So I'm like, okay, maybe if I can get into this company, that'll be cool. Um, so I was able to get into Google because they needed someone who spoke Dutch. I'm originally from Belgium. And, uh, and so I, I get brought in. And so that's uh, that, that I basically started working in Google Ads in August of 2002. Um, but started in PPC before that. And then when I was at Google, that's when the light started shining. And I was like, oh my God, like there's so much money going through these ads. And I started actually dabbling a little bit more in affiliate programs. Um, and it was funny because I was working at Google and I was a big advertiser at Google, uh, sort of this unusual dual role. And that led into me being an evangelist. Yeah, because I mean, it's quite interesting. You talk about the kind of the the, the go to. I mean, that that was my kind of first foray as well. Was like buying traffic for a penny a click, right? And you look at kind of what the clock cost of traffic is now. It's like crazy money. Right. And you think, wow, imagine if you could go and buy your traffic now. One, if you could even buy clicks for first off, but like, um, but but yeah, I mean, if you can buy them for a penny, I remember. Every, all the advertisers were outraged when they kind of m- raised the floor from one cent to two cents, right? And everyone went yeah. ballistic and said, how can you possibly charge two cents for a pig? But exactly. The, but the, I mean, those were the days. And then, no, and the I'm pig. also thinking like, and then we were doing bid jamming, um, right? Because it was this whole transparent auction mechanism and you knew exactly what the second person was bidding. And you're like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to mess with them. I'm going to raise my bid to just one penny below. But then your whole day was not marketing. It was like literally watching the bids because people would lower their bids. And now you'd be the one jammed up to the top. Um, it's, yeah, we've come a long way for sure. Yeah. Cause I, I, I was, as you say, I mean, uh, a lot of the time, a lot, a lot of what we were doing was, was forcing, uh, competitors to bid, an awful lot more money for the traffic that they were they were buying, right? Because the the way it worked was you whatever they were paying. So if they said I'm going to pre- I'm prepared to pay fifteen dollars, and in a lot of cases, lazy advertisers and agencies would do that. They would say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to pay fifteen dollars because I know I can still make the numbers back out on the back end for me, right? But if the second advertiser bid bid fourteen ninety nine, then they would be forced to pay fifteen dollars. But if the next one in the auction was like five cents they would only pay six cents to actually be in that position and it's sort of like it's again quirky the way the the kind of the auction model worked um but yeah i mean you know as you say it was it was always um sort of a, a strategic sort of game that the people played right and in some respects i mean i know that your your current business optimizer is is kind of like a SaaS business that helps um marketers kind of like with, with that 
sort of automation and, and tracking and analytics and, you know, just getting everything kind of dialed in. Uh, but sort of way back in me, I, again, I don't know if you remember, there was a company called Go Toast, right? And it was one of the yeah. very original bid management tools that kind of existed way back in the day. And I remember um, kind of going to one of the uh, the industry events and the guy, I think his name is Dave Carlson, was the guy running it, right? And I basically said, look, Dave, I will put my people against your machine any day of the week. I think my people will <laughs> understand so much more about the clients that we're working for and kind of what what the 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 way in which everything works, right? So it's much more than just what are you prepared to bid? There was so much more sort of strategy to kind of add copy and things like that, right? He never took the bet. I wish he had, right? Because I would have loved to have seen whether it kind of like whether that would transpire or not. And in some respects, I mean, if you kind of fast forward to exactly where we are now, I still think we're almost in the same situation now with AI, right? Because again, I know that you're a big, a big, big, big fan of, of AI. And, and in some respects, I'm a big fan of AI as well. But I think the challenge is that, you know, you, you've got to layer in what you know about things in, into the AI. And I don't think there's, there's none of that opportunity. I mean, I, I came off a call with my Facebook rep just recently, right? And we were talking about, you know, I know the demographic of my clients. And at no point in time has Facebook ever said, What's the demographic of your client? What's your ideal customer avatar? What's you know what's their sort of makeup? What gender? What age groups? What are their interests? All that sort of stuff. None of that. It's almost like, well, we're the only people that could possibly know what what people are interested in, and you haven't got a clue. Um, and I'd just be interested in kind of know what your thoughts were on it. Well, I mean, there's, there's so many fascinating topics in that, right? And I completely agree. On the, on the premise that humans plus machines are better than the machines alone or the humans alone. Um, and, and I think the other thing that we keep saying is we're not competing against AI, but we're competing against other advertisers who figured out how to use AI and technology better, right? So it's, again, that human plus machine sort of angle. Um, and it's fascinating, too, because when you look at Meta and Facebook, they sort of grew up many years after Google AdWords, and machine learning was at a much further stage. And so they could really come in and they could say, listen, just kind of tell us what your website is and, and we'll figure it out. We got it from here. Whereas the Google AdWords advertiser came in when machine learning was nascent. It, it didn't really work very well. And so we had to do everything from choosing the keyword to writing the ad. And it wasn't just a keyword, but it was every spelling mistake of that keyword. Um Right, And then for each of those individually, we had to set bids and, and it was all of this complex manual work. And then as machine learning got better, Google sort of tried to make that shift towards, oh, let us figure it out. And that's where we are today with performance max campaigns. Um, but there's this underlying frustration because we are used to that control. We want that control. We know we can do things better in some cases with that control. And even if it's as simple as like you're saying, right, like what is your target audience? Well, sure, Facebook and machine learning, they'll figure it out eventually, but are they going to spend $10,000 of your budget to get to that insight where you could have just gone in and said, okay, we already know this. You don't need to spend $10,000 of mine to get there, like spend that $10,000 on the audience that I can already tell you works better. Um, and so that's sort of the, the interesting dilemma. Um, and I also think that the ad platforms, they're really making a push for democratizing advertising, if you will. So they want to make it as easy as possible for anyone to get decent enough results to do well with this. Um, if you do well enough, you're going to keep investing in Google ads. And that's a good thing for Google because it creates auction depth, it creates auction pressure. So they make more revenue that way. But, but for us as more advanced advertisers who know all the, the controls that we should be taking advantage of, it's frustrating when it gets taken away for the sake of giving a level playing field to everyone else. Yeah, because I think one of, one of the challenges was always things that, again, I mean, I think I talked to, to Nava about it. You know, one of the challenges was always there will be some advertisers that have got YouTube and Google Display Network and historically Gmail campaigns completely dialed in and working for them, right? And it's almost like mm -hmm. Google have taken away the, the kind of secret source that they've had and given some of that secret source to everyone else by introducing these sort of, if you like, watered down versions of what, what was kind of working before, right? Again, I, I think a lot of advertisers either got ran, ran YouTube GDN got success or ran YouTube GDN 
had horrible results and stopped doing it, right? And and Google didn't want that. They didn't want people to be able to pick and choose which part of their ecosystem you, you kind of played in, right? They want they want you to be able to play in all of it, right? Because that way you're going to spend more money in theory. Um, and I, I just was, again, I, I've always been sort of fascinated by by sort of the, the context that, you know, Again, some some elements of AI I love. I absolutely love that there are elements that you know. If you have like um, you know, a static image and you want to be able to create a video, you can kind of create a video from that like really easily now, right? Whereas historically, that was you'd probably have to go to a design agency and spend thousands of dollars to kind of get a video created. If you wanted like a six second YouTube short, it used to take forever to get it right. Whereas now with the the kind of the YouTube builder, you know, you can kind of basically just say here's a couple of texts, here's a couple of pictures, here's a couple of call to actions, and they'll make the video for you, which again, I think they've given you templates to be able to do that, right? So I think more and more advertisers are in a position to be able to create assets now than ever before, which that element I, I absolutely love, right? But as you say, like, I think, I think um, you know, you should be able to kind of have input into, you know, I, I mean, like with, with Facebook, they have this thing where they, they, do the optimization and they give you a score. They started, I, I almost think they're, they must collectively be sort of meeting somewhere and talking about what shitty ideas can we come up with that we can implement this and force upon our appetite <laughs> because they're not going to turn their back on us. Though. We're too powerful. We're, 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 no, they're not going to kind of t- walk away and take their money and spend it elsewhere. Right. But it's, you know, it's, it's horribly frustrating sometimes. Again, I mean, like we're a, we're a, performance agency right so we get paid on results so we have clients that are cutting back on their spends now because they can't kind of make things work they can't make things back out the way they used to right and we kind of pinpointed it to most of the the changes have come when they've introduced sort of elements of ai that they've mandated you have to kind of use this or they, they basically said this is the best practice now right and that's yeah. kind of again, made, made some elements of the performance really kind of not that well. And, and you know, again, if you look at it, not all businesses are the same. Not all businesses are small businesses. Not all businesses are enterprises kind of, you know, and I think they're trying to shoehorn one sort of set of rules into to kind of fit all advertisers just because they're all advertisers and they're all different. Exactly. exactly. And that sort of uh... – you know, everybody goes through Pmax. Everybody advertises across all of the the platforms that that touches or the surfaces, I guess. Um, but it takes away that capability for the experts to, as I call it, unlevel the playing field to take advantage of that secret sauce. And, and then there's also the bigger question with AI and and these 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 automation campaigns from Google. Like, to what degree did your success in a Gmail campaign teach the system that's now driving performance max how to do it for everyone else? Uh, and it's almost like, well, I invented that secret. It's also like, why are you giving that to everyone else now? What's in it for me? Um, and with AI broadly, because it's scanning basically the whole internet. And like one thing, you can go to a script and you can say, sorry, you can go to a GPT and ask it to write a Google ad script. How does it know how to write an ad script? Well, because there's a handful of people who've written a lot of scripts, myself being one of those. Um, and so clearly it's it's learned something from me. Um, now, I'm not particularly upset over that. Uh, I, I do sort of equate it to, you know, if you're a student in school, you read books, you look at examples that others have written and you learn from that. It's just that GPT happens to be a much quicker and faster learner and can ingest much more data. And it's not necessarily violating copyrights, but but, but I, I think it is a broader question for humanity. Like, where are you going to focus your efforts if you know that automation is just going to take the best of what you just did and apply it to everyone else? And so the thing that you have as an agency, like your secret sauce, is that still the thing that you can sell? Or is the thing that you innovate faster, you test faster? Like, I think the value propositions that we've had just need to be kind of questioned and, and potentially reevaluated. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's funny. Like, I, I, um, have you got reactions on your computer? Because I don't know how to turn these off. Oh. <laughs> if someone can teach, I should ask GPT how to do this. It just so, frustrates that. Like, I'll put my hands behind my back. <laughs> no, if if you go up at the top, so like on, if, I presume you're on a Mac, right? I am. Yeah. So up at the top, there should be like a a little sort of green uh, icon with a camera on it. 
And if you click on that, that should tell you which camera you're, you've chose. And you'll see so that reactions. there's reactions. Oh. If you yes. turn reactions off, Finally, that's right. Thank <laughs> you, Jim. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I might leave that one in the uh, the final edit, but you never know. I'll, I'll probably chop it out. <laughs> um, so, so Fred, like, uh, so, so you you spent sort of uh, you, you went to Stanford. You kind of did a bit of uh, affiliate marketing to all intents and purposes. You then joined Google, um, and you worked for Google for a period of time. How long were we actually at Google for in total? So I was very close to ten years. And normally I would have stayed around longer because you, you generally get like a nice gift at a 10 year anniversary at a company. But uh, I was led to understand that it was a paper printout of one of the Google doodles for the Google 10 year anniversary. And I was like, yeah, I can print it out myself at home. So uh, when it's yeah. time to go, it's time to go. So I uh, was so just you, shy of that. You're a pre IPO Googler, right? And again, I, I talked yeah. to Nava and I basically said, I love the pre IPO Google more than the post IPO Google, right? Because I, I think their, oh, what sure. their objectives were, that were, what they were trying to achieve as a business were very different then, right? They were very uh, accommodating of feedback and, you know, actively sorted out. They, they, again, I mean, you know, if you think about it, all of the agency partners like me who back in the day sort of sat in a room with their engineers, right? We were basically unpaid consultants. We were getting, we were helping them to improve their product, right? And fortunately they did, right? Which made it better for everyone, right? And again, it would have been nice if they kind of had chucked, a, chucked us a bit of cash at the time for, uh, you know, for our, our time. I mean, we get invited to research um, events now and we get, you know, do you want 80 pounds for kind of doing a 45 minute, um, you know, know, research know. feedback or something. But, but hopefully you made some money uh, by being an agency and by like being able to say, hey, listen, I'm one of the people who got to be at Google and influence this product. So I know it better than anyone. Yeah, I, uh, I, I do know that. agencies will be. I always, I always say to people, I, I basically helped create the My Client Center and Google Ads Editor, uh -huh. right? Because, like, again, I sat in a room and I said, look, I'm going backwards and forwards. At the time, I was going backwards and forwards to, I think, Hong Kong. I said, look, I'm going backwards and forwards to Hong Kong. It'd be really good if I could kind of download an account, do some work on the plane because there was no internet on the plane at that time, do some work on the plane, and then upload the work at the other end when I got there. They went, yeah, that's a good idea, and they sort of – that that's when kind of part of where that came from. And I said the same thing with uh, my client center. I basically said, look, you know, I've got 50, 80, hundred accounts and every single one I have to log in. It's like a complete pain. It would be great if we had a toggle button, we could just toggle in mm -hmm. and go in there and, and have a drop down that would show us everything kind of what we had. And um, yeah, that's a good idea like that. So I, I, I say yeah, I had yeah. some input into um, to making that a kind of better product. I'm sure I wasn't the only agency that did, but you know, yeah, no, and for sure. Thank you for uh, for putting that feedback in, right? And it, it was, and I think Google for a long time did continue to listen to advertisers, and to a degree they still do. But you know, the matter of the fact is that once you become a public company, you become beholden to a whole set of uh, investors, and uh, yeah, the things will change. Uh, and, and I think Larry was afraid of that and didn't really want to go public. But then at the same time, you have this whole contingent of engineers and product managers and you need to keep them happy you need to keep them on board and they have choices in the silicon valley right like there were so many other startups um you know facebook was coming about and if you didn't give them a financial incentive through an ipo they would have all just left and google probably wouldn't have been in the shape it is in today it would have been a far less impressive company yeah it's funny i i always remember the um the, the very one of the very early Google ads. I mean, again, you, you mentioned there, we hope you got some money. I mean, one of the things we had in the early days was there was an agency kickback, right? So we used to get 15% mm -hmm. discount on the media that we spent, right, for traffic. Um, you know, so so if, if we spent a thousand that dollars on media, we only spent it only cost us $850, but we had to kind of bankroll the media, right? So we had to kind of cover the uh, the cost for that. So we were kind of on the hook. So at, at the time, I mean, our turnover was really high. Our profit margins were quite low, right? But, um, you know, but, but for it's us, like it was- the in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. Right. I mean, 15% yeah. kickback on all the media spend. That's yeah, and, and I mean, really, they, they kind of did it because they needed- to compete with TV, radio, and print, and that's what happened there, right? So all the agencies got kicked back on TV, TV buying, and and Google wanted to kind of compete with it. And what happened? I mean, again, I th I'm I'm trying to think. I think it was like 2007, I think maybe when they 
took it away. Uh, and, I, and basically they said, well, you know, we think it's creating an unlevel playing field because, you know, the like some agencies are getting it and some e- agencies are not getting it. So we're taking it away. I'm like, why don't you give it to all agencies then? <laughs> Rather than leveling the playing field against us, why don't you kind of level the playing field by giving it to everyone? Right? Oh, no, no, we don't want well, to do I, it. But, but then by that token, I guess if you were an in-house company and you didn't use an agency, then you would have paid the extra 15%. Yeah. And, and, and I think that was always the argument, right, is Google tries to be fair by running the ads in an auction. And I mean, you were there too when it was a CPM priced model. So the yeah. initial AdWords was you'd buy ads on a CPM basis and they'd show at the top of the page. Yeah. I ran and he's like, hey, we're, we're going to make sure the ads are relevant and look at the CTR component of the ad. And that's going to be the thing that ranks it. Um, and then very quickly, all of these CPM brands from or CPC, CPM ads from big brands at the top of the page, they start making less money than all of these like mom and pops bidding CPC clicks. Um, and they're like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, that's really unusual. Like, why, why is General Motors paying far less for, uh, for their ad um, than Jimmy's car dealership? Yeah. And that's when the light went on for Google. And they were like, okay, everybody needs to be on the CPC advertising system. Yeah. Um, but, but then to make that fair, right, you, you couldn't just sort of give these discounts to some people and not to other people because then the auction would get out of whack. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, it if it exists now, but I, I think in certain markets there probably still exists where there's like some form of like a agency incentive to um, kind of to promote or something. It's sort of unspoken, right? Like e- even yeah. in 2007 when they got rid of it, it was like, well, you know, we never really had this, but we kind of did, and we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but now it definitely doesn't exist. Like if you thought it didn't exist before, now it definitely doesn't exist. But there's people like you who actually had that discount. So clearly it was around. And I also think it was different between Europe and the United States for a while. Um, it was deprecated in some markets before others. As yeah, I understand maybe- it today, like we're not able to get anything from Google. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, when I when I was getting the discount, I was able to use it to kind of recruit more people, right? To provide better mm-hmm. service to the clients I had, get more clients, right? So for me, there was a kind of like an added value to to the relationship that that I was bringing to to the table, right? And not, and again, fortunately for me, I was in a, a good position that we weren't just. I mean, I know some agencies, that's all they were charging. They were just charging the the kind of kickback. Right, they they were just getting mm-hmm. the money from Google, and basically, to all intents and purposes, the clients thought they were doing the ads for free, right? Um, you know, and so again, some big agencies would use the PPC ads as a way of getting TV. So, like, we'll run your PPC for free, right? If you give us your TV ads, right? And and some people kind of gave them their TV spend on the back of um, of that, uh, which again, I, th- I right. thought was quite interesting that that um, that's what they did. And in terms of bad decisions, um, I would say that probably falls in the category of a bad decision, right? Like if you start basically undermining the value of, of what you're charging, right? So if you're an agency and you're basically making the client believe that you don't pay us anything, yet we have all this expertise in-house and we do these amazing things, and then Google pulls the rug from under you and that kickback goes away, now you're there and you're, you have to explain to the client uh, well, actually, we do have to charge you 10% of ad spend. And and even then, we're making less money than before. So, like, you're not going to get as much service. Um, yeah, I mean, so, the, the, the way that all- Yeah, I mean, we okay. lost a couple of clients at the, at the time when, when that sort of transition happened. But I know there were quite a few agencies that kind of went out of business because – you know, as you say, they, they talked to all their clients and said, hey, I'm going to have to pass on some of the costs that Google's imposing on me. I'm going to have to p- impose it on you. And they basically said, oh, we'll just, we'll just go with another agency. So that's what they did. So, so they lost those clients exactly. altogether. Yeah. Um, and at Optimizer, we, when we think about how we run business, it's really – it's about making sure our customers are happy that we have the subscriptions in place, um, all of these incentive programs that exist or relationships with the bigger companies. Um, you know, that's not what you should base a business on, right? Because that could be pulled away at any moment from you. Whereas if you have a happy user of your software 
and you keep building better product to keep them happy, like that seems like a much that's within our control. Um, now, of course, there's economic factors, right? So a company may have a directive from the top saying, hey, listen, we need to cut cost. Go and figure out where you want to cut. And maybe they decide to cut the optimizer subscription, but it's not because our product wasn't good enough, right? The, the product continues to provide value, improves value as we start integrating performance max, as we start integrating social platforms and all the new things that Google is doing. There's a ton of AI that we put throughout our platform. And so that's how we really think about protecting our business so that these, whatever Google decides to do, whatever Microsoft decides to do, that's not going to kill our business or even be a significant impact if, if something happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, so I, I've been a an optimizer customer for quite a while, right? Love the love the product. I mean, I, again, I think when I first started looking at it, I think I was working at Cheap Flights at the time, and um, you know, I, I've told the story where I hadn't even taken my jacket off, and I managed to kind of get them to agree that they were going to kick the existing bid management tool into touch, right? And the reason that they were going to kick it into touch was because it was using a sort of you know, it, the the company basically had all the travel companies as clients, right? All using the same software, all doing the same thing, all making bids adjustments once a day, right? That was that was their kind of their, their modus operandi. And I'm thinking, well, it basically means like if if I'm bidding say fifty cents, and then somebody else comes in and bids fifty one, and somebody else fifty two. Before you know, it, we're kind of up there, and then you might go right. I'm going to bring them all back down, right? And then you start that process again. And it just, it was like a complete never ending ladder up, down, up, down, up, down, right? And it was based on the number of keywords you had in the account, right? When I looked at it, we had probably 75, 80% of all the keywords had never had an impression, never had a click, but they went and made a a review of the the bids and made an adjustment anyway, right? Which to me seems crazy. But, um, you know, so I, again, I made the decision to kind of, to, to keep that into touch, right? I was looking for an alternative solution at the time and an optimizer. I think, again, I think p- partly because of your um, your time at Google, I, I figured you would absolutely know kind of what this was all about, right? Again, I think you'd been kind, kind of quite prolific at the time in, you know, writing community stuff, right? So you'd put, put out kind of like your knowledge in, into the public, which again, I think is a, is a kind of phenomenal um thing that everyone should be doing. They should be taking what they know and kind of cascading it out there to, to let people know what they're capable of, right? And it's, again, I think a lot of people will hire you based upon the, you know, like, like those sorts of things rather than necessarily what it says on your website. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I couldn't agree more. Um, and a little anecdote. So m- my wife now, at the time, she was a product manager uh, or product marketing manager at Google, and she was running some um, feedback sessions with agencies for an event. And she's like, hey, can you come in and like as sort of the expert, uh, help guide the conversation? And we're going to have two groups. We're going to have a group of sort of the smaller agencies first, and then we're going to have a group of the bigger agencies. And one of... Sorry. All good? Yeah. I always forget. I have one of the first. And one of the first things we asked them was, how do you think about sharing your knowledge with the community? And in the group of small agencies, they were all like, well, we can't because it's my secret sauce. And like, if I tell someone else what we're doing, like everyone's going to do it. And like, then I'm going to not have a, a successful agency. And okay, fine. We go on to the next session, the, the big agencies and same question. They're all like, oh yeah, we, we have like people blogging and we have people doing podcasts and we share everything we know. And like, it's driving so much business for us. And so again, clearly like the big agencies, the ones that had become more successful were the ones that were willing to share. And like you said, they get clients because people, people judge you based on the expertise that you're exhibiting in that way. And, and then like the point that you're making about 
a bid management system. I, I don't think the expectation is that you're going to hire an agency and the agency is going to do exactly what they did for everyone else, but they've exhibited the expertise and the thought process. And so they can apply that and do something really unique for your business and help you grow. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like, it's social arbitrage, right? Like if you know stuff because of the, the space that you work in, the types of clients that you have, like leverage that into gaining more clients. And that's the arbitrage that you do is, is your knowledge turns into money through more clients. So don't sit on it. Don't hide it. Because by the way, if you like, you're not the only one who figured out how to do that secret sauce, somebody else is going to talk about it. And guess who's going to get that next client? Well, it's the person who was public about it, who talked about it. Yeah. And I, again, I, I always say that the, there's no such thing as a secret source. I mean, you know, it, it, it may be a, a better process, but, you know, no, again, nobody's, I don't even think Google knows the algorithm, right? There's probably, a couple, no, no. People, right? There's probably a couple of people that understand it at a really super granular level, right? But most people, again, it's a lot of it's trial and error, right? I'm not a fan of trial and error. I mean, I don't want to be testing things. I want to be like running things that work, right? And I think that's, again, I think that's where some agencies can kind of really kind of cut the mustard is they've got the track record of being able to kind of go, well, we got this process of bringing things in, which means that you don't have to spend a lot of money trying to test stuff out, right? You don't have to spend 10 grand to, while we work out how this all works, right? You can kind of get to success much quicker as a result of, you know, following a, a sort of a, a very systematic thought out process that talks about right. you know, tracking yeah. analytics and all that stuff. And, and I, I would argue that you have two types of clients, right? You have the client who comes in and demands that from you, says like, listen, we don't want to go down the path of testing. We just need results right now. And what you said makes total sense. But then you get some clients who are like, hey, Jim, you've been doing an amazing job. Like, let's give you $10,000 of budget to maybe try something new. Um, and that's great because now through that trust that you've built, you, that opens up your ability to experiment and sort of get that knowledge that you need for the next phase. Because face it, right? The... Google ads, like sometimes I wish it wasn't changing as much as it did because it's a, it's a lot of work for my team to keep up with all the changes that Google's doing. Um, and it's a lot of work for agencies, right? But, but we have to experiment. We have to figure out, okay, given that something in the algorithm changed, which Google may not be telling us, or given that there's now generative search results, like, sure, that's going to have an impact on how people interact with ads. That's going to impact how we message in the ads. That's it going to impact how we do bidding. Um, and all of these things we have to test so that we're ready for that next wave of innovation and we continue to have success uh, with the ads just like we did in the past. Um, and I, I, one of the things I really like about you as a person, but also kind of like just, again, just Optimizer as a company is, you know, your involvement in the community. So you you run your PPC town halls. Uh, what was the kind of like, what made you think about sort of setting those up in the first place? Well, so I know you from conferences. So obviously I was on the conference circuit for a long time. And then the pandemic hit. And as a result of the pandemic, all of the in-person stuff went away. And that was a huge part of my job. I was like, what am I going to do now? Um, and so Zoom was just up and coming. And everybody started to do these Zoom webinars. And I was like, yeah, sure, let me do a Zoom webinar. But then everybody was doing them. They started looking so boring, so ugly like the, the, the four little screens next to each other. I was like, well, let's do something better. So discovered StreamYard, hey. uh, much like you started experimenting a lot with nicer studio setups and like better sound and, and just making it kind of giving production value. And that became the replacement for speaking at conferences. And then it was amazing too, because, you know, you go to a conference in the search industry and, you know, a good audience is 200 people in your room. Um, I mean, sometimes you get a keynote, you get a, a little bit more than that. But if you're in the PPC track, like, listen, there's just not that many people. And here I can do something online where I don't have to travel, fly to New York for a day, where I don't have to get a hotel. And I can literally out of my house in an hour of my time, interview some interesting guests. And we have 700 people watching or listening, uh, much more of an impact. And so that was the whole thing then, like, yeah, let's double down on this. And then the town hall format was initially... Um, I guess it was election time and, and these town halls were happening. I was like, oh, yeah, people should be able to ask questions. We need to do this live. We're going to have a couple of experts. 
Uh, now we've gotten away from the town hall format. So there's actually a rebrand coming to make it more in line with what it really is. But uh, but just the quality of guests that we had and uh, and you've been on and many other grades. Um, and it's fantastic. I mean, we just have a conversation about what's on your mind in the industry today. How are you dealing with it? How are you working with automation? How are you handling Pmax? We've had Googlers come on. We've had people from Microsoft ads and they all just share uh, very candidly what's working, what's not working. And, and I think people want those conversations. They want to be a fly on the wall in that room and, and learn from it. Yeah, and I think what a, what a, a lot of people don't realize, I mean, again, I think this is probably episode 21 or 22 or something like that of my podcast. I mean, it's very time consuming to kind of create content like this long format uh, with with guests. I mean, you've got to invite the guests and get everything set up and everything. Um, and, and again, for me, I'm very passionate about it. I think, you know, again, I want to help educate the next generation of digital marketers that kind of come into the industry to learn from some of the people that, again, I've spent all my formative years in the industry learning from and and hanging out with and everything else, right? Because eventually we're all going to go, right, I'm, I'm done now. I don't want to do this anymore, right? And um, yeah, and, and I just think that some, in some respects, I kind of want it to be there as a kind of in perpetuity because, again, if you upload it to YouTube and stuff like that, it's there forever, right? So, you know, at some point in time in the future, people can go in 20 years' time, look at what this old this old clown is talking about, AI and what is <laughs> – you know, I know, and, and the topics are going to change, right? But I, I very much agree with what you're saying. And so from my perspective, one of the things in PPC Town Hall was we would bring in at least two guests. And I would always try to get one guest who had some name recognition, who I was a known value, and then give a platform to someone who was a little bit newer, who maybe hadn't done webinars in the past. And for me, that's just maybe selfishly, but I want to be the one who launches that person, who gives them the opportunity to become a brand in the industry like you and me, because eventually when they become the brands, like I want them to be my friends. I want them to remember me fondly. And if I need something, have them help me back. Right. So, and that's what community at the end of the day is. It's about like being nice to other people and helping them in ways that you eventually want to be helped uh, and not hogging all the credit and the stage for yourself. Um, there's that. And then as far as you and your legacy, um, let's make the virtual gym banks, right? Let's uh, let's turn you into an AI <laughs> avatar. Let's feed it all of the things you've written, that you've all of your podcasts, and that's the beauty of AI is that we don't have to really die anymore. I mean, yet, sure, our physical presentations will die, but everything we've said, the way we say, the way we look, um, that can all be digitized, and and someone in a hundred years from now can have a conversation with the virtual gym banks and. Sure, your ideas on bid management may seem outdated in uh, 2130, but they can have a conversation. They can ask you why you did what you did, and that uh, AI will probably represent you pretty well. Yeah, and it's, it's funny, like you talk, you're talking about that. I mean, some of the, the books that I read when I was starting out in sort of like marketing and digital marketing and advertising, trying to write good ads and everything, you know, again, I'm reading, um, you know, books from like, uh, you know, uh, Claude Hopkins from like the 1920s, right? He was a kind of door-to-door -door salesman. And But if you read the book and try and put your 2024 brain on it, you can really see the context of what he was trying to achieve. I mean, scientific advertising was one of his books, you know, and he's talking about, you know, using primarily coupons to try and track yeah. down kind of what, what success you'll have by launching a particular product in a particular lo location, right? And uh -huh. you look at it and go, well, really the kind of the modern day coupon is probably a QR code or, you know, something like that, right? I mean, you can you can think of what they were thinking of back then in today's terms, and still kind of go, well, that that still that strategy would still hold true today, right? Even though it's like nearly a hundred years old, um, you know. Exactly, and the the end has remained the same, and the means that we use to achieve that end, that's just the thing that's evolving. Um, I mean, a little interesting stat that I recently found, but 60% of the job titles um, from today didn't exist 100 years ago. And so in that example that you just gave, like digital data science uh, or um, digital advertising analyst, like that would not have existed as a title, but what they were trying to do and what they were trying to achieve, that's exactly the same thing. And I yeah. also think it's fascinating that to some degree, 
as more of the data analysis is being handled by machines, which by the way, machines are really good at data analysis, much better than humans. So we can actually go back and figure out, well, it's not about how to track the coupons, but what should we say in the coupon? Like, what is it that's motivating people in 2024 to want to buy this product? Um, right? Is there some recent news about uh, the, the, the science of food? Does that change how people think about food and nutrition? And how do we position our coupons to, to speak to that newly evolving um, perception in the market and what consumers are going to care about? And that's the marketing we can now once again focus on because tracking the coupons is handled for us. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I remember back in 2006, uh, not long after I sold my original agency, um, I went over to, we, had, we opened an office in Hong Kong and we were on exactly the same floor as Google, right? We were in the uh, International Financial Center, um, the one that kind of appears in one of the, the Batman movies. I'm, I'm not sure what, which one it is, where he stands on the top of it, gets hooked off by Morgan Freeman in a, in a helicopter. Um, oh, that one, yeah. That one. Um, so we were in that building. Um, but, but I went to Shanghai for a conference. I went to the ad tech conference that was taking place in Shanghai, right? And I, I landed at the airport. Um, again, huge, huge airport, never been there before, um, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't know where to go, right? So I kind of, um, you know, I walked outside. Somebody said, oh, you need to get the bullet train into town. So I got the bullet train, you know, the the kind of the, the, the maglev train that, that kind of goes at 400 kilometers an hour straight into Shanghai in like next to no time at all. But I got off at the train. I'm like, I had no idea. Everything's in, in sort of Mandarin. I couldn't understand any of it, right? So I got back on the train, went back to the airport, right? And um, got a taxi from the airport to my hotel because I thought I'm never going to find my hotel in a million years. <laughs> and but, but So that was kind of a bad decision, kind of getting the train in the first place. But then I got into the taxi. And fortunately, I, the, the hotel had sent me a QR code. And when I got into the taxi, I just held the QR code up to this sort of reader. And that told the taxi driver exactly where I wanted to go. And everything in China at that time, 2006, that 18 years ago, was being done by QR codes. You wanted to go for a restaurant, go for a meal, you go and see the concierge in your hotel, they would send you a QR code, you'd go to the taxi driver, scan it, that would tell you where, where, where to take you. You go into the, the, um, you know, the, the hotel, go to the restaurant, right? They scan the QR code that way they can confirm that it, it's you and it came from you know a particular hotel. That I'm sure probably meant that the concierge at the hotel would get a kickback for recommending that that restaurant, right? So again, closed loop affiliate marketing in its in its finest. Um, but you know, again, you look at it and go, and it seemed like QR codes should have been the absolute future, but they died a death, and now all of a sudden, again, I think partly because of COVID it's come back and they're now kind of much more prominent in everything that kind of goes on. Yeah. Um, and again, I mean, let's, let's call it a, a means, right? So it's a means of communicating some piece of information. And I think with the new wave of meta AI glasses, for example, and the AI assistant buttons, uh, the rabbit, the humane button, uh, there's a couple of others. There's, Still not that good, but the whole premise is that, listen, we don't need QR codes to, to help guide people, right? Like it should visually be able to understand what we're looking at and help guide you. And so if the, the text happens to be in Mandarin, like I can have my meta glasses, it'll translate it for me. Um, I mean, not that innovative when you think about Google Glass, so you pull out your phone, like they've been doing that for a long time. But, but I think where we're sort of getting to is, is a world where the processors are smaller, the AI is faster. So now you have it sitting in your glasses and they don't look like the dorky Google Glass, right? It just looks like a pair of sunglasses. Nobody knows that it's translating stuff for me. You're a the, glass. I, I never had one. Though. Uh, I, glass. I have my little museum of Google memorabilia. I have Larry Segway. I have a Google bike. I have a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I have my Google original hockey jersey when I played with Sir, Sergey and Larry. Um, but a Google Glass, I was ne never able to score one. So if anyone has one. Yeah, I think I think Barry Schwartz has got one. I don't know if he still uses it. He's he's, he's probably the ultimate Google fanboy, Apple fanboy. I think every single iPhone right. from the very beginning, he's like got it on day one, and um, you know. But again, I mean, I, th I think when you when you're an innovator like he is, then uh, it's definitely 
something that you, you probably need to kind of do. It. It's funny, going back to, to job titles, I always kind of used to say to people, when when people would come in for, a, for an interview, stuff like that, they'd be, what, what would my job title be? And I'm like, well, what would you like your job title to be? Right? <laughs> what your title is isn't going to dictate what your job is, right? I mean, the job is going to be the job, right? And, um, and I've always maintained that a job title is only important when you're looking for a job with that as the title. So if you're a looking for a job as a sales manager, if you're a sales associate, you're going to struggle to get a job against other people who are already sales managers in other companies, right? And the reality of it is, is that, you know, um, those job titles only matter for you actually getting a job. A bit like, you know, education, you know, you need a certain education to go on to the next step, step in education, which then takes you to potentially university, you get your degree, that gets you your first job. And then after that, most of the time, the companies that you work for don't really care about what you did at university. They care about what you did in your first job. And really, you're right. only as good as your last your last role, right? And in some respects, if that last role was a disaster, then you may want, kind of want to skip some some time and um, and jump over it. But yeah, and in your job, provide value and be invaluable. And did the one uh, this was a good decision, not a bad one. But always remaining very close to the customer and understanding what it is they want, because then if you get laid off or something else happens, like you'll know exactly what people are willing to pay for. And you can either uh, solve that as a service, you can solve it as a software, but you'll be in a position to to know what to do next. Um, You know, too often people go into job roles and it's like middle management where they kind of talk to upper management and they talk to the people talking to the customers, but they live in that void where everything is secondhand information. Um, and that's, that's a dangerous place to be, I think, right? If you lose your job and you're like, well, I heard such and so say these things about customers, but you don't know who the customers are. So you can't go and be like, hey, uh, just lost my job. Like I can help you solve this problem, right? I can make some money that way. Um, yeah. So be, be, be invaluable and provide value. And don't ask for that job title because in terms of a bad decision, so there was a woman who came in to Google in 2002. She was also Belgian. So she was competing against me for that job to be the uh, original AdWords person to start the Dutch product. But one of the first things she asked was like, uh, where's my office and where's my assistant? And meanwhile, I was sitting in a room with, you know, at the time it was only seven people, seven other people sort of like working on AdWords. And I was like, that's fine. Like, it's it's a shared conference room. It's the I'm feeling lucky lounge at uh, Google Building Zero. And I don't need an assistant. I don't need an office. Like, I'm here to, you know, hopefully get a job at this company that seems to be going somewhere. Um, and she was very quickly shown the door because for her, it was about prestige and title and, like, certain amenities that she had to have as opposed to coming in and proving that she'd be valuable. Yeah, I had somebody come in and they said um... – in the interview, I said, do you have any questions? And they said, um, what's your sick policy? Um, and I said, well, you know, if you're sick, we'll, we'll pay you if it's legitimately sick. Um, you know, and they said, and what's the holiday policy? <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you actually want this job or do you just want to kind of have something where you can either be off on holiday or be off sick? It seemed like that, that was the kind of conversation that we were having. That's terrible. And, and so like <clears throat> regenerative AI, like people should totally prep for interviews, right? Like if you have a hard time knowing what questions to ask, tell GPT, okay, here's the company I'm applying to. Like what would be some smart questions to ask when I have an interview? And then you can even role play with GPT as if you're talking to the interviewer and, and get some feedback on it. So, and, and that's where I think the whole generative AI and, and technology, I'm so excited about it because it really changes the landscape from you know, saying I can't to saying I haven't yet. Um, there's so many more opportunities. And like you were alluding to, you can generate video, you can do images. So even if you're not a graphic artist, like I can't is no longer a good answer. And if you work with a client in, in marketing and they want a video proof of concept, I mean, sure, talk to GPT, talk to Dolly, like they'll, they'll figure something out. And um, and I, I really learned this in scripting too, when you talk to a developer, the more that you can show them a prototype of what it is you want, the better they will build it and the quicker they will build it. So as opposed to being like, hey, I need I need a script that helps me manage my keywords. 
that's vague, that's non-specific. Like they probably don't even know what a keyword is because they've never done Google ads. If I go to them, I'm like, here's a little script and it's it's like, it doesn't work that well. It doesn't scale that well, but it shows you the logic that I'm going through for identifying what is a good keyword. And GPT helped me write this. I can give that to an engineer and it's a script and they can say, oh, totally get it. That's the logic. I'll turn it into an API tool, which scales to, keyword, to accounts of millions of keywords. Um, and so that, that to me is the promise of the future of AI and generative AI is just like we can do things we couldn't do in the past. And that just makes things really exciting. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm kind of um, I'm upbeat about the future. Obviously, I have my my grievances. I'll always kind of air them because that's just the type of person I am. But, you know, but at the same time, I am quite upbeat about the the kind of the future of the advertising ecosystem as a whole, my, my role in it, my involvement in it, what I'm trying to do for the community. Again, I really appreciate your involvement in the community as well. That's for me is like, is like what you guys do at Optimizer is definitely community led. You're trying to, you know, yes, you want to make money for the company because that enables you to grow the company, which enables you to kind of invest into the community and invest into, you know, sponsoring events and things like that, which again, if you didn't do that, then we would have We'd all be working in isolation, which which isn't really kind of what um, what agencies want want to be doing. So uh, yeah, so people you know, like our- yeah, exactly. No, and thank you for all you do. Like, uh, there's very few people who've been doing this longer than I have, and it's really nice to have an OG who's. Uh, it sounds like you're ready for another thirty years of uh, more of this, right? So uh, let's do yeah, it together, Jim. My wife keeps saying to me, you know, when are you going to retire? I'm like, well. I enjoy working. I mean, the day I'm going to start retiring is when I start retiring is probably when I don't enjoy work anymore. Right. But I really enjoy what I do. I enjoy the clients I work with. I enjoy the people I work with. I enjoy the community I work with as a whole. Right. Sure. I mean, I have, I have issues that, that, um, you know, I'm trying to address and I'm trying to do it in the best way and most positive way I can. Sometimes that's always difficult. Cause like I said, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon, a bit of a grumpy old sod. So, um, it's not always the easiest thing to kind of do that. <laughs> Right. Very sarcastic. I sometimes wish my sarcasm kind of wasn't as evident and prominent as it is, but unfortunately that's just who you are, right? You can't change, you can't change your spots. You are who you are, right? So. Well, you know, it's, uh, for as negatively as you may talk about yourself, you're a great guy and that sarcasm is, uh, is well placed. So. Well, I really, really enjoyed talking to you. So, so Fred, obviously we've been on for a while. I uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to uh, come and talk to me today. Um, all your contact details and information will be available in the show notes. I'll also leave a link to Optimizer. Definitely, if, you, if you're involved in digital marketing, advertising in any way, Op- Optimizer is by far and away the best tool I've ever used for that particular purpose. Um, again, like a, been a customer forever. Uh, and uh, I think you've written some books as well, haven't you? So. I'll leave links to your books as well. Uh, yeah, digital um, marketing in an AI world. I wrote that back in 2018. Uh, super relevant today in the, the world of Gen AI. And then the second book was Unlevel the Playing Field, basically talking about, you know, as everything becomes automated, what is it we can still do to uh, give ourselves a little bit of an edge? Good. And at some point in time, I know we saw each other fairly recently, but um, hopefully at some point in time in the near future, we'll be able to um, to grab another drink in uh, in person. If you get over I think so. I think uh, Brighton SEO is definitely one thing that both of us will be at in San Diego. Um, so if you haven't bought tickets for that, everyone watching, come hang out with Jim and me. Cool. I'll leave li- links to Brighton SEO in the uh, the show notes as well. Thanks again, Fred, cool. for kind of uh, listening in. And uh, if you haven't already followed the podcast, make sure you do. If you're watching it on YouTube, which I hope you are, make sure you subscribe to the channel and we'll catch you on the next episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks.